All right, we're recording. Um, so it's great to see you all, as always. <clears throat> and um, we're gonna get we're gonna get started here today with a story. The story is the story between Rabbi Yehuda. Uh, Rabbi Yehuda was uh, is the one of the greatest sages of all time. He is the author of the Mishnah. The Mishnah is the seminal work of the oral Torah, the first time that the oral tradition was written down. And there's a story. When he was a baby, it was forbidden to circumcise your son. And Rabbi Yehuda, his parents, very special people, they decided to circumcise Rabbi Yehuda. They decided to ignore the decree of the Romans. <clears throat> so they circumcised their son. And the governor of Jerusalem at that time uh, uh, was very upset. And he wanted to send them to the Roman emperor to, to be punished. So Rabbi Yehuda's parents are taking this baby, Rabbi Yehuda, to uh, Antoninus, the Roman emperor. Sorry, they're taking the baby to the Roman emperor of that day. And uh, on the way, the parents, they stopped by a Roman family that they knew. And uh, this Roman family also had a little baby. And they start talking, and they're friendly. And the Roman family says, why don't you take our baby presented to the Roman emperor. And that way, the Roman emperor will think your baby was not circumcised. They say good idea. So they switch the babies and they go and they go to Rome and they show the baby. And of course, the proctor, the person in charge of Jerusalem, gets gets all um the proctor of Jerusalem gets in trouble. The Roman emperor gets uh and the Roman emperor lets them go free. But from that point on, this baby, Rabbi Yehuda, and the baby he was switched with, whose name was Antoninus, became good friends. And one day, Antoninus actually became the emperor. And the tradition of the Talmud is eventually later in his life, Antoninus actually converted. But uh, there's many stories in the Talmud of this friendship between Rabbi Yehuda and Antoninus. <clears throat> and one of those stories is that uh, one day, Antoninus decided to send a gift of precious gems and jewels. Of course, they're doing the grass outside now, so you may hear it in the background. You know, they always pick Tuesday at 12 o'clock. Uh, uh, of precious gems and jewels. Uh, he sent a gift of precious gems and jewels to his friend, Rabbi Yehuda. So again, the emperor, Roman emperor Antoninus, sends the precious gems and jewels to Rabbi Yehuda. So friendship, you send a gift back. So Rabbi Yehuda sent back a uh, mezuzah scroll. And Antoninus gets this scroll back and he's offended. It's one thing, okay, Rabbi Hood is not as wealthy as him, but to send him a, a little, uh, you know, piece of paper with Chinese instructions, you know, uh, what, what is this? You know, what, what, that's, that's, that's uh, demeaning. You know, if you send me something nice, you can't afford the same thing, but send me something nice. Why a little tiny scroll? So, uh, Rabbi Yehuda sent back to the emperor. He says, no, you got it all wrong. My gift is much better than yours. The gift that you sent me, the precious gems and jewels that you sent to me, I have to guard them. The gift that I sent you, the mezuzah, it guards you. So which one is really more precious? The mezuzah that guards you or the gems that you have to guard? So it's a beautiful story. We say it all the time. <clears throat> And when I say all the time, I mean rabbis say it all the time. But uh, what do I want to pull out from this story? This story gets to the crux of uh, something that we're going to get to today, which is what is really more important? What is more precious? What is more valuable? Is it the, 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 the mitzvot, the 630 commandments, or everything else? Is a big house? Is a lot of money? Is gold? Uh, what is more precious? What is greater in this world? What is the real importance in this world? And, and of course, we're going to answer that uh, it's going to be Torah and mitzvot are actually greater. Just to uh, bring that idea home. Uh, Chabad, many years ago, used to make this publication for children. And the picture on the front was a picture of the globe with the Ten Commandments sitting on top of it. But in the picture... The Ten Commandments, the two tablets, are actually larger 
than the world. Now, of course, we know physically they don't look larger, but there's a message there, is that Ten Commandments are, as we're going to describe today, larger and greater than the world in many ways to the point where in a picture, if you're going to depict the Ten Commandments as larger than the world, you're actually correct. So we are going to get to that all today. How does this work? So let's back up a little bit. We had chapter 20 and 21, which of course Adam wanted me to repeat with what went on, which as he's correct. We had chapter 20 and 21. In chapter 20 and 21, we went through a lengthy discussion how the world is totally dependent upon God. There is no existence of the world outside of God. The world constantly need, needs God's vivifying force in the world. And without it, the world would cease to exist. Not only that, the world is encompassed and subsumed within God. All right? So we said, if the world is within God, then how do we get to evil? So in chapter 22, we have to explain where does evil come from? There's a diminishment of God's light to the point where God's light is hidden. It can even be hidden from the subject matter. <clears throat> of course, this diminishment only applies on our side. It doesn't apply from God's side. But from our side, there's a diminishment. And it creates what we call the evil in the world. And they are called foreign gods. Why are they called foreign? Because, first of all, they're like back. They're like things that God doesn't really want to give uh, energy to. And um, <clears throat> the negative forces themselves can sometimes resist God themselves. And the energy that's within side of, uh, of these foreign gods also feels itself. Uh, it, it's not happy to be there. It's an exile. Exile means... You are not in your right place. You're not in the right place that you want to be. And this energy feels like it's not in its right place because the marker of foreign energy, the marker of <clears throat> distance from God is a feeling of ego. And that was all last week. Now we're done with ego. Now we're done with the evil side. Now we're going to discuss the good side. So again, the world is going to be split between what we're going to call ego, where there's less of God consciousness, God consciousness, by the way, is not a consciousness of something that's out there. God consciousness is actually a consciousness of the reality. Evil and ego is the opposite of reality. That's not my phone, is it? Is that my phone? Is anybody here ringing? I heard something, but um, I don't know if it is your phone or not. Oh, oh, oh okay. Some, some, all right, all right. It, it was a phone. It's someone else's phone in the room. Okay, all right. It's, and now uh, since left. Okay. Um, <clears throat> reminds me of... Uh, <laughs> we want to get political here. It reminds me of a joke. I, I, so I won't mention any specific religions just to make it clean. You know, a guy walks into uh, one house of worship and he says, uh, can I make a phone call? And the guy says, uh, sure, no problem. <clears throat> uh, sorry, he walks out of the He says, "Can I can I call God?" He say, "No problem. It's uh, ten thousand dollars a minute. Ten thousand dollars a minute. It's too expensive." He goes into another place. Says, "Can I call God?" Sure, no problem. Seventy five hundred dollars a minute. He walks into a synagogue <clears throat> and he says, uh, "Can I call God?" The rabbi says, "Sure, no problem. It's five cents a minute." So the guy says, "Why is it so cheap here?" He says, "Listen, here it's a local call." Anyways. All right. Uh, so uh, that that is the, the joke as they as they tell it. Um, That's cute. That's cute. <laughs> so not not here to uh, to uh, demean any religion. So I just uh, made it made it general. But a joke is a joke. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so all that being said, um, so chapter twenty three, twenty four, and twenty five, we're going to talk about the other spectrum. We're going to talk about not how do you move away from the consciousness of the reality? How do you move away from a connection to God, which is through ego, as we discussed last time. But now we're going to discuss how do you connect with God, and not just in a conscious way. <clears throat> so in this week, we're going to discuss not only how do you become aware of God, but how do you actually connect with God? And they're not necessarily the same things. 
I can be aware of God and not connect with him. I can make a conscious choice, right? I can be aware of God and choose to steal. The Talmud, the Talmud even tells us that, that a robber can stand at the edge of his tunnel to steal from someone and pray to God to be successful. So you can be aware of God and um, be conscious of God and uh, not connect with God. So we're going to get into not only being conscious of God, but we're going to discuss how do you connect with God. And the answer is, of course, going to be <clears throat> through connecting with what God wants. If, as we said last week, there are elements within this world that God gives them energy, but he doesn't want them. They're there for a purpose, but he doesn't want them themselves. Just like you pay certain things, you, you do certain things, you do certain medical things. You don't want the thing itself. You want what it gets you, right? The same thing with God. He gives energy to certain elements in this world. He doesn't want them themselves. He wants what they bring to the table. He wants that they allow there to be free will. But what that means is that there are also things that God wants them wants it themselves. They're not just a means to an end. It's not just like food that's a mean for survival. Though of course, some people just like the food itself. Uh, they are something that God wants it themselves. And of course, what is that? That is going to be uh, Torah and mitzvot. The study of Torah and the doing of mitzvot are the inner will of God. That's what God actually wants. And in this class, we're going to discover, um, <clears throat> we're going to discover um, four stages or four elements in how mitzvot connect us to God. Number one, we're going to discuss how mitzvot in general bring energy, physical and spiritual, into this world. Number two, we're going to discuss what it means, what it describes in the Zohar that mitzvot are God's limbs when God doesn't have any limbs. Oh, number three, we're going to discuss how our limbs, our physical limbs, become connected to a mitzvah. And number four, uh, we're going to discuss what the Torah has at mitzvah stone. So we say Torah and mitzvot, but we're going to actually differentiate between Torah and mitzvot. So we're going to discuss number one. Se section number one right now is how do mitzvot bring more physical and spiritual, obviously, but more physical energy into this world. So the answer we'll give through a parable. <clears throat> if you have a business, if you have a business, uh, a very big business, uh, a big business has a lot of workers. Um, but, and there's many elements. There's design, there's graphic, there's sales, there's uh, stocking shelves. And the owner of the business knows that the whole reason the business is open is to make money. Okay, or if let, let, let's assume that's what it that's what it's there for. It needs to make money. I'm cutting off. Am I cutting off for anybody else? Let me switch. Let me switch headsets. Oh, yeah, yeah, just a little, nice. just a little bit off and okay, on. I'm gonna switch microphones. Oh, okay. Uh, hopefully, uh, and again, always let me know if there's issues with connection. Adam was letting me know in the beginning. Uh, let me know if this microphone is uh, gonna have less cut off. Okay. So. Again, you have a business. <clears throat> the business is open for a purpose. Uh, the business is open for the inner desire of the owner. Let's assume for right now the desire of the owner is to make money. That's why he has the business. Okay, he wants to help people along the way, whatever he does. But ultimately, he wants to make money. Um, once you know what the purpose of the business is, then you put extra emphasis on things that bring you closer to that. And you stay away from things that bring you farther from that. That's why businesses, when they make decisions, <clears throat> does this further our goal? Does this further uh, what we're trying to accomplish? Or does it just spend extra money, right? There's always uh, things to spend money on. And sometimes a worker does not understand uh, the inner purpose of the business. He has a job and um, he's a worker. He does what he has to do. He wants to make money. But... If the worker can buy in and know what the owner's goal is, if he can buy in also to the owner's vision and goal, um, he can actually help the business make more money and in turn allow him to make more money. So again, if you're a good worker and you really know what the owner wants 
and you can further the business in the direction of what the owner wants, then A, the business itself will make more money. And B, you as the worker, you'll get more because you are helping to further what the owner wants. We're assuming the boss is a good boss, of course, right? And so how does this apply to the world? Very simple. God created the world. He wants us to, his inner desire is uh, to bring godliness into this world through Torah and mitzvot. That's his inner desire. So this world has many elements to it. There's trees and there's and there's plants and there's and there's houses and there's uh, microorganisms. There's so many things in this world. But God's inner desire in this world is God wants a dwelling place for him in this world. God wants a place where he can feel at home. And that is through doing a study of Torah and doing mitzvahs. As Rashi himself says, um, Rashi says in the beginning of creation, it says, Bereshis, in the beginning God created the world. And R Rashi takes the word Bereshis, and Rashi says, Bereshis is actually made up of two words, Bez. Bez means two, Rashis, two Rashis, uh, two beginnings. Uh, and Rashi says the world is created for the Torah and for the Jewish people who will keep the Torah. So therefore, think about it like this. When you study Torah, when you do a mitzvah, you are, just like in the business, you are doing what the owner wanted. You are furthering, uh, so to speak, the owner's intention in his business, which is God. And that is going to automatically bring more money into the general business, into the world. It's going to bring more energy into the world, and it's going to benefit you. So it brings a double benefit. Okay? And this idea that um, do, studying Torah, doing mitzvahs, bring more energy into the world is clearly in the Torah. The Torah says, If you will walk in my uh, commandments, and I will give you rain in its time, and the land will give its fruit. We also have it in the second paragraph of the Shema, and if you will listen to my mitzvot, then I will give rain. And there are many, many psukim that are like that. <clears throat> and uh, therefore, a mitzvah, because it is fulfilling the will and the desire of the creator who created the world for this purpose. So he's automatically going to give more energy into the world and more energy into you. In addition to that, many commandments have a specific type of energy. For example, uh, mezuzot have a special energy for protection because mezuzot uh, bring holiness into the home. Charity gives a special energy and physical blessing into your money. As our sages say, if you give a tithe, you get uh, you become richer because by giving the tenth to charity, you are showing that that's the real intention of why God gave you the money. You know, God is kind enough to give you the ninety percent. Ten percent, though, was the real reason to give you to give charity. Um, so that's why to, when you give tzedakah, you get more parnasa because you are taking this money and using it for its intended purpose, just like the business. Right. If you if you're taking the business and furthering it to its intended purpose, you're going to get more money. Let me just close the window. I see glare in my glasses. So it's not it's not like um, some uh, voodoo or unconnected idea. It, it, the idea is very connected. The idea is if you are going to take something and use it for its intended purpose, then you're going to get more of it. Very simple. Just like in a business. So if we are going to take our money and use it for its intended reason why God gave it us, God's going to give us more. It's not like a, a reward as much as it is a consequence, a natural consequence of what's going on, right? Okay, let's let's take another example. Someone who um, keeps a family purity, right? Mikvah. Um, automatically, you'll have a better marriage because... Um, or whatever it can bring blessings in. i can't say automatically it will bring you know if if, if 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 a family keeps all the laws of the torah but they scream at each other they're not keeping other laws of the torah so you know <laughs> yeah but it brings special blessing it says that a man and a woman should have the shekhinah between them by keeping the laws of family purity uh you are bringing the shekhinah um <clears throat> and that is expressed in the in the law of family purity so again if you're keeping your marriage in the way that God wanted it to, it's automatically going to bring more blessings into your marriage. Um, so all these uh, Shabbat, Shabbat, 
brings blessing to your weekday work, right? Uh, it brings blessing to the whole week. It elevates the entire week. <clears throat> because again, the whole world is, is existing from God's will. When you bring into the world God's inner desire, automatically there's going to be more blessing, more spirituality, and more physical blessing in this world because it's doing God's inner desire. Think about it. If you give your child uh, uh, money, you give them uh, allowance or whatever it is, and you see they're spending it wisely, you want to give them more. <clears throat> if they're not spending it wisely, then it's a necessary evil. You need to give your children money because they're your kids, and uh, otherwise they might be upset at you or whatever. You have to take care of your kids. But you're more incentivized to give them money if they're fulfilling <clears throat> kind of what your ideas in life are. Um, and that's why our sages tell us that the reward of a mitzvah is the mitzvah itself. The mitzvah itself contains a blessing in and of itself. The mitzvah that you do itself is the blessing. <clears throat> now, I said in the beginning of the class that uh, this class is going to be a response to some extent to something that uh, a, a a new hater online, Candace Owens, was saying. And uh, she was quoting from the Rebbe, and she was uh, she, she quoted a video she posted on her Twitter um, <clears throat> about, um, you know, about how uh, the Rebbe was, uh, uh, I forget the exact words, whatever she said. She, she was quoting from a video in which the Rebbe was was saying, when, as it comes to Rosh Hashanah, that, that we are the source of blessing for the world. It, it says a, a Jew is a balabas, a Jew is literally means an owner over the world. And so she was taking that to mean that, uh, you know, Jews believe, I don't know, we own everything and we're, 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 we believe in, we're better than everybody and, and whatnot. <clears throat> um, and everybody else is second class citizens because we're the owners and, you know, whatever they are, I don't know what, what she believes. <clears throat> but what we're describing here, Natanya, is really the real meaning of what the Rebbe was saying. For those who study Hasidic philosophy and what the Rebbe was saying, the Rebbe is saying that we as Jewish people through the Torah and the mitzvahs have the opportunity to bring blessing into this world. In fact, the, the Talmud tells us that if the Gentiles knew how much blessing the, te the temple brought to them, they would never destroy it. If they understood how many blessings the temple brought to the rest of the world, they wouldn't, uh, they wouldn't have destroyed the world. Sorry, they wouldn't have destroyed the temple. So the same thing is it was, was the Rebbe's message before Rosh Hashanah. We have a responsibility as Jewish people to realize that the blessings of the world are going to come through our actions. Of course, we have a responsibility to have the rest of the world keep the seven Noahide laws, and they have an ability to also bring uh, blessings into this world. But as a Jewish people, uh, we have an opportunity to uh, do that even more. We have 613 commandments. And as I always say, if anybody really wants the more commandments, they're welcome to join us and convert. So most people uh, are not <laughs> don't want to have the extra responsibility, but that's it's our belief that we that God gave us the six hundred thirteen commandments, and God gave them seven Noahide laws, and uh, us through our six hundred thirteen commandments, we have the ability to bring extra blessing into this world, and so therefore to an extent we are so to speak we we have ownership over what's going to happen in the world over the coming year. It's a it's a heavy responsibility. And uh, we should embrace it and accept it. And uh, this is what the Tanya here is telling us as we're going to, you know, to, or whatever. You might not see it in the Tanya as, as we'll explore it. But this is what the Tanya is telling us is that mitzvot, the commandments, the good deeds are a channel for God's inner desire. And if they are a channel for God's inner desire, when we fulfill God's commandments, we are bringing God's inner desire into this world and automatically. It will bring extra blessing into this world. So let us see this inside. <clears throat> Let's see. I have to share the right screen. Um, I'm on a different computer today, as I may have mentioned. Let's see advanced. Oh, let's go to advanced sharing. Nope. Uh, Google Chrome. I don't know what you're going to see. We'll find that in a moment. That's the wrong screen. Uh, let's see. Did it change? Yeah. Okay, good. All right. So let's go. 
that is the wrong thing. I don't think you need to know. And Amazon allowed us to return something. Okay, so here it goes. Uh, you know, by the way, returning is the call of the time of this year, right? We have to all do, do, do to show what we have to return and repent. Someone asked me they wanted to see the, the clips. Um, Candace Owens, what she said exactly. Okay, I can send you after the, after the class. Okay. Um, but she, she said many other, that's not the only disturbing thing. Her attack on the Rebbe was just yes, one, I, one I, of them. I, I don't have tolerance for anti-Semites anymore. So uh, she's just, yeah, yeah. I'm totally disappointed on her. I started listening to her when she was in Dennis Prager a while back, but she has changed completely. Anyways, she said she said multiple things, but if you want to speak specifically this idea of the Rebbe, what she said, I could send it to you. And but personally, I, I uh, whatever it's up to you. Reb Chonya is on. Okay, he's alive. Okay, he's uh, in time for the yard site. Okay, good to see you. All right, we we we're discussing how. Uh, Torah and mitzvot are a channel for blessings in this world. So we're now, I just gave a lengthy explanation, we're now going to read it inside. Okay, so in chapter 20 to 21, we were introduced to the non-dual idea how everything is absorbed within the all-consuming presence of God. That's the reality. But this is, raises a difficulty as to how we are to perceive Torah and mitzvot. If even a table and a chair, in their essence, are really nothing other than God, then what makes the mitzvot special and holy? By suggesting that there is nothing outside of God, the non-dual idea seems to equate the holy with the profane, violating a distinction which rests at the heart of the Torah. This chapter will address the problem by drawing on the wisdom of chapter 22. There we learn that while everything is in its essence God, such an elevated viewpoint is not easily within our reach. We function in a realm of separate consciousness, made possible by massive diminishments of God's light and the hiding of his face. While God's view of the universe sees everything as part of him, from our perspective, separate entities are real. The Tanya will argue in this chapter that the Torah represents a unique bridging of the two perspectives, divine and human. Torah study enables the non-dual reality of God to become accessible, even in this world of separate consciousness. And just similar to what I said a moment ago, that again, the rest of the world, the table of chair, they all represent a purpose for, right? The table is here to serve a further purpose. But Torah and mitzvahs are the purpose itself. And therefore, they create this bridge in which there's no hiding of God. It's a direct connection with God and a direct connection to the consciousness and a connection to God. So let's read, let's continue here. Based on the above discussion of the non-dual idea in chapters 2021, we can explain the Zohar's teaching and clarify it with additional insight beyond our discussion in chapters four and five, that the Torah and God are totally one. Right? The Zohar says the Torah and God are totally one. In chapters four to five, we learn that both Torah and mitzvot provide a profound merging experience with God because the Torah and God are totally one. Our chapter will continue to explore this idea with additional insights. So let's continue. And again, the idea is going to be as I have given you the preface. The Tikkun Zohar explains the special connection. Um, one second. Am I, am I looking at... Uh, just one second. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the special connection with God that occurs through mitzvot observance with a statement... And I mentioned this in my preface as well. That the 248 positive mitzvot are 248 organs of the king. So if you if you break down the 613 commandments, there are uh, 248 positive commandments, 365 negative commandments. So the 248 positive commandments correspond to 248 organs of the king. Now, this is the line which expresses what I've been what I just gave you in the whole preface. This the implication of this teaching is that the mitzvot are the innermost will of the divine and his true desire. Remember how we explained in previous weeks that there's 
or we just gave in the example of the business. There's the inner desire and there's the outer desire. Both things I want. But the inner desire are things that I want for them themselves. And the outer desire are things that I want for a further purpose. Like a desire for money so I can buy food. Like food so I can survive. But survival is what I want, for example. Okay. The Tikkun Zohar. <clears throat> Um, describes the mitzvos as the organs of God's metaphorical body to emphasize that they are pure and unadulterated expression of God himself. But obviously the mitzvos to represent God expressing himself in worldly terms, as he says. <clears throat> the mitzvos to represent God's inner self as it is dressed in all the created worlds, upper and lower, to give them life energy. Upper and lower to give them life energy. That's the line. To give them life energy. <clears throat> they get life energy. When God is enclosed within a mitzvah, that mitzvah is what God wants <clears throat> because it's a direct connection to God. And automatically there's a divine energy in it that comes to the world. Let's continue reading. But that doesn't mean the purpose of the mitzvah is to give the world their life energy. In fact, it's the other way around. God wants the mitzvahs to be absorbed, and therefore he creates the worlds to make that possible. So again, we shouldn't get confused. It's not that mitzvahs exist to give the world energy because God wants mitzvahs to exist. Therefore, he gives the world energy. <clears throat> right? Because in order for there to be mitzvahs, there has to be a world. There has to be people. There has to be choice. There has to be physical elements. <clears throat> so it's not, again, we shouldn't get confused. Think the mitzvahs are there so we can have rain. Mitzvahs are there so we can have money. Mitzvahs are there so we can have protection of our homes. No. God protects our home through the mezuzah because when we put up the mezuzah, we are indeed fulfilling God's commandment to make a, a holy home and a, and a special home. And he's going to protect that home because he wants us to continue having that holy mezuzah on our door. That's we get confused. We think a God is so nice, he gives us a special alarm system to put on our doors. When we think about it deeply in the way the Tanya is describing it to us, it's not that um, the mezuzah is there to serve the home. The home is there to serve the mezuzah. And by virtue of the mezuzah, the home stays protected. It's a whole different uh, outlook on, 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 on mitzvot and, and how mitzvot um, protect us and how, how they give us blessings in our lives. It's a whole other way of looking at it. It's not that Shabbat <clears throat> exists. Well, you know, and that's, that's, actually, that's actually a more complicated um, idea, Shabbat. Let's give another example. Um, let's go with uh, Mitzvot that promise uh, we, we, it's charity, right? So same thing with charity. It's not that charity gives me a special blessing that I get money. I have money so I can give charity or or other mitzvot related things that I do with the money. That's why the money really exists. So everything else is there to serve the mitzvah that I actually do with it. The mitzvah is the purpose. Everything else is secondary. My home is secondary to the mezuzah and, and to the kosher that goes on in the home and to the hosting that goes on in the home. Everything else is secondary to the ultimate purpose. We have to get into our mind this idea that the Hasidic philosophy talks about this a lot over and over again. This idea between God's inner will and outer desire. Pnimi yasaraton, chitzoni yasaraton. Our inner will are the items that we want for themselves. They are the ultimate purpose. And then there are the items that we want because of what they bring us. And the same that it applies within us, how we do it, that's how it applies by God. And so we should never get confused to think that the mitzvahs and the Torah are here to serve us. Or that, you know, God is here to serve us. You know, sometimes people think God is a waiter, you know. Uh, when we ask for blessings from God, we are asking because we want blessings so that we can continue to fulfill our mission. Just blessings so I can continue to have fun. It's not why the blessings are there. The blessings are there so that, unless fun is, of course, part of the mission, that's okay. But the blessings are there to fulfill your mission. And so we turn to God and we say, God, I, I really want to do your will. I, 
can you please give me these blessings so I can accomplish it? Okay. Let's continue. <clears throat> so let me read this line again because that was such an important line. That doesn't mean the purpose of the mitzvahs is to give the world their life energy. In fact, it's the other way around. God wants mitzvahs to be observed and therefore he created the worlds to make that possible. And let's continue. For the life energy and flow to all the worlds is contingent on mitzvah observant in our lower world. I'm going to read that again. The life energy and flow to all the world is contingent on our mitzvah observance in the lower world. Since the whole point of the world is to facilitate Torah mitzvah, the world's existence depends upon them. In fact, it is through Torah mitzvah that life energy flows to the world. I want to say that uh, this idea is... Uh, um, this idea is actually the whole idea of Rosh Hashanah and the blowing of the shofar. I'm just going to pause the uh, sharing over here because this is an important Hasidic idea which has revolutionized the way Jews have looked at the holiday of Rosh Hashanah. To many people, Rosh Hashanah uh, is, is um, a day of judgment uh, and a day when we want to make sure we get blessings for a sweet new year, whatever it is, and, and it's true. But if you look at the history of Rosh Hashanah and you look at the liturgy of Rosh Hashanah, a, a interesting picture comes out. What was the first Rosh Hashanah? Anybody knows? What was the first Rosh Hashanah? Who celebrated the first Rosh Hashanah? Not Adam? the Jews? No. Yes, yes, Bruce, what did you say? Adam. Adam, very good. Adam in the Garden of Eden. At the day of Rosh Hashanah is actually not the day the world is created. That's the 25th of Elul, Menachem Elul's birthday. The uh, day of Rosh Hashanah is the day Adam and Eve, and of course, subsequently Eve, are created. And it says on that day, that was the first day that God was called as king. Okay, till that time, there were, you know, other other beings. Adam and Eve were created last, but nobody proclaimed God as king, it says, until Adam and Eve came around. They proclaimed God as king. And that is one of the themes. There are three themes when you when you read the High Holiday Liturgy. One is discussing God as king, and that started with Adam and, of course, Eve on Rosh Hashanah, the first Rosh Hashanah, 5,784 years ago, soon to be 5,785 years. Uh, there are also, uh, we talk about Zichronos, we want God to remember us for the good. And then there are verses that we read about Shofar. But the first element we read about is proclaiming God as king. Now, what does proclaiming God as king have to do with judgment? And, and according to many, the whole idea of blowing the Shofar is to proclaim God as king. But what does that have to do with um, what, what does that have to do with, with uh, judgment? Because they have judgment. Okay, I get it. So, you know, God created the world or, or finished creating the world on this day. So every year he he wants to judge us on this day. It's, he, he, it's a nice day on the calendar. Why this large emphasis of proclaiming God as king, especially when we proclaim God as king every year? The answer is, Hasidic philosophy explains, is that every year, every Rosh Hashanah, God gives the world a one-year lease. God gives the world a one-year lease every single year. And if we are successful, which we have been so far, to uh, convince God again to be king over the world for another year, um, then he will do it. See, we're confused in today's society because to us, um, a king is like despots, like people who want to be a king. A real king in Hasidic philosophy and, and real leaders, actually, real leaders are people who don't want to be the leaders. You have to beg them. The easiest example I have is, of course, the Rebbe, but he wasn't the only one. The Rebbe, as we know, after his father-in-law passed away, he did not want to be Rebbe. It took a full year till they convinced him. But once he took the leadership, he was full on leadership. But real leaders are not ones that are begging to be leaders. When they're asked, when they're asked 
strongly, then they accept upon themselves to lead. King Saul, the first king, he didn't want to be king. He was appointed by Saul. The people were begging for a king. The people were clamoring for a king. So there was a king appointed. Now Saul messed up. Once he became king, he became too obsessed with the throne. That was the problem with King Saul. That's why we went to King David, who was not obsessed with the throne. King David was not obsessed with his, with his rulership and kingship. He was obsessed with God's glory alone. But that's what a real king is. A real king is someone uh, who is waiting on the people. And so every year when it comes again, God says, do, do you really want to do what I ask of you? You know, are you really ready to do the commandments? You, you really want me as king? And so we spend the beginning of Rosh Hashanah proclaiming God as king, asking him again to be king. And uh, when he accepts, then that brings blessing for the rest of the year. And uh, that's why Rosh Hashanah is such a special moment and, and the moment of blowing shofar when we proclaim God as king. It says that's the moment we get convince God to uh, rule over the world again. It says that in, in Hasidic places, uh, sorry, in, in Chabad, it says that the night of Rosh Hashanah, before we blow the shofar, it's called a very weak night. The world is on a very weak energy, you know, because the lease is up and God is sustaining it till the next day to see if uh, we're really going to proclaim it as king. So why did I take this detour? Because we were saying over here that the entire world exists for the sake of the mitzvot. And that's what we do on Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah is, it says that we get judged by God every single day, but Rosh Hashanah is the general energy for the entire year. That's what's called the head of the year. Just as a head controls and contains everything that goes on in the rest of the body, Rosh Hashanah is called the head of the year, right? Hasidic philosophy also points out, Rosh Hashanah is not called Tehillat Hashanah. The Hebrew word should have been, Rosh Hashanah should have been called Tehillat Hashanah, the beginning of the year. But Rosh Hashanah is not just a beginning of the year or a new year. In Hebrew, it actually means it's the head of the year. Why is it called the head of the year? Because the head contains everything that's in it. Rosh Hashanah contains the divine energy for the rest of the year. When we proclaim God as king and we say we are we are going to do as you ask of us, because otherwise, right? You can't tell a king, I want you to be my king, but I don't want to listen to you, right? We have to come to God and say, God, we want you to be king and we are going to do, some, do your commandments, right? That's why we have to come to Rosh Hashanah with... A, a feeling of willing to do better. This is the connection between the judgment and proclaiming God as king. Because God is, is ready to remove his energy. In order for us to get back that energy to this world every single year, we have to say to God, turn to God and say, oh, we are going to do better this year. We're willing to accept you as our king. We're, I'm going to take my life. I'm going to take it in the hands. And I'm going to do more. I'm going to show in my life a little bit more that you are truly the king of the world. That this world exists because of you. That's what we're meant to be doing in Rosh Hashanah. And then when God sees that, God gives a general energy to the world. And also each and every single one of us, he looks at us individually. And he tells us uh, what type of energy he's going to give each and every single one of us. What type of blessings. It says that a person cannot make more money during the year than, he, than has been allotted to him on Rosh Hashanah. It says you can get less, actually, because it's, it goes like this. It works like this. On Rosh Hashanah, God gives a general, so to speak, lump sum. But that lump sum is sitting up in heaven. And over the year, through our actions, God dispenses that lump sum. But over the course of the year, you cannot get more than what's been decided in Rosh Hashanah. It's been, there's an energy that, that comes every year Rosh Hashanah. That's why Rosh Hashanah is, is such a powerful and important day on the calendar. And we should not uh, overlook it. It's not just a new year time to celebrate, which uh, there is a celebration. And the celebration really is because God is accepted to being king. That's why, that's why there's an element of celebration. You may find this funny, but it actually says the rabbis kept the Rosh Hashanah services shorter, right? Unlike Yom Kippur, it's shorter because we're meant to celebrate. There's a certain element of celebration. We're celebrating the coronation of the king. God accepts upon himself the kingship. But we have to remember, how did we get God to accept the kingship? God is not a dictator. God is not a ruling with an iron fist. God accepts the kingship when we accept upon ourselves to do what he asks of us. And so Rosh Hashanah is, is a very vastly important day in which we turn to God and we say, God, we want you to be our king. We know you are the ultimate ruler, the king, the, 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 the world exists because and for you. And I want to take in my life different things that show that you are the king. You are the master of this world. And this is what we're talking about in this week's Tanya, or I should say not this week's Tanya, this, this lesson of today is that 
Torah and mitzvot are what God really wants. And therefore, they are the ones that are going to bring down the blessings. And so when it comes to Rosh Hashanah, if we want to bring down God's blessings, I have to pick things that align with God's value system. You know, a lot of people have all different value systems, uh, today especially, different things that they think are the uh, most important values in the world. But God said Torah and mitzvot. Okay, now they can obviously be observed in many different ways. When I say observed in many different ways, I mean a stress. We all have to do the mitzvot, but some people, for example, have a stress in visiting the sick. Some people have a stress in studying Torah. Some people have a stress in charity. Everybody has uh, an area of Judaism where they can excel, so to speak. Um, but, you know, the general idea of any, whichever mitzvah, mitzvot that you're doing, and, and hopefully we get to do all of them throughout our lifetime, you know, they tell the story of the guy who who divorced his wife when he was dying, so he could fulfill the mitzvah of divorcing. But uh, I don't, I don't advise that for anybody. Um, but uh, you know, it's it's not not every mitzvah. Some is whatever. It's another discussion for another time. How do we actually keep all six on the thirty commandments? But they don't, they don't really apply to everybody. Uh, so there's no mitzvah to divorce your wife to fulfill that commandment. But we 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 will all try and do as many commandments as we can throughout our lifetime. And. <clears throat> Um, each and every single one of us in our own way. And so <clears throat> as it nears Rosh Hashanah, we should remember this powerful idea that we read today, that the world, that mitzvot don't serve the world, the world serves the mitzvot. Because the mitzvot are the inner desire uh, of what God wants. Um uh, just to uh, tell a story to bring this home, because stories are always good. Uh, there was a great uh, tzaddik. His name was Rabbi Yeshua of Apta. Rabbi Yeshua of Apta, the Apta Rav, he was called, from the city of Apta. And uh, he had a, a follower, a chassid, who was very wealthy. And one time he asked <clears throat> that um, he asked that, uh, that the Rebbe, Rabbi Yeshua of Apta, asked his chassid to give 200 rubles for a certain a project that he wanted to do. Um, now, that chassid, at that time, you know how money goes. Even if you're wealthy, money comes, money goes. At that time, he was in a kind of a squeeze for money. And he pushed off uh, fulfilling his Rebbe's request. And uh, slowly but surely, this chassid started to lose all his money. Eventually, he came to his Rebbe and he asked him, Am I being punished because one time I didn't listen to you and I was in a difficult situation? Am I now being punished that I lose all my money? Is it low fair? It's not fair. How is this fair? How, how is it fair that I, I follow God all my life and I'm, I'm such a devoted person? I give so much charity. And one time I'm asked and I don't give it because I'm in a difficult position and now I lose all my money. He, he, he felt it's not fair. So the Tzaddik answers him very simply. And if you study today's Tanya, it makes a lot of sense. He said like this. He said, the money was never yours. The money that you had was never yours. God always gave you a certain amount of money. And within that amount of money, a part of it was not for you. It was for the poor people. Um, and really that money was supposed to go to me. <clears throat> he was telling this chassid. He says, really the money that you have was supposed to be mine. Really, I was supposed to be the one to give all this care. I was supposed to give charity. I was supposed to be the one to help poor people, but God knows that I'm very busy. I have to study Torah and, and meet people all the time, and I don't have time to deal with money. So God took the money that belonged to me and gave it to you so that through you, I could give charity. But once you stop being good, a good banker, you know, the bank was, it was abrogating your deal, uh, I had to give my money to a different bank. I moved my money to a different bank. So this again expresses the idea wasn't a punishment. He was a banker for the tzaddik's money. And the moment he was a bad bank, right? If you ask your bank, can you transfer uh, $100 to Duke Energy for my bill? And they don't do it. You're going to move your money to a different bank. Uh, so all this is to point out that it's not punishments when uh, we don't fulfill the mitzvot and things go wrong. And it's not uh, rewards when we do the right things and uh, we get rewarded. They are natural consequences of uh, the actions that we do. Now, another concept that was mentioned in this section of Tanya that we just read was the concept of uh, these being the limbs of God. 
we're not going to have enough time to, to delve into that topic. We're going to have to get to that next week. So I want to recap how we started. We started off saying that um, we're, we, we, you know, we discussed a couple chapters about how the world is subsumed within God. We discussed a chapter about how things can be distant from God, how there can be evil in the world, how there are other gods, so to speak. We spoke about how that's really rooted in the ego, which denies the godly energy inside of it. And this week, we're go we, we started to discuss things that are very connected to God, and that's, of course, Torah and mitzvot. And Torah and mitzvot connect us to God, and they express and it expresses itself in four different ways. One is that mitzvot are a uh, channel for God's inner will and inner desire. And automatically, as we discussed today, it brings you blessings in your life. And we described how that works in Rosh Hashanah as well. <clears throat> God is creating the world for the Torah and mitzvot. So if you want the blessings in your life, you come to God in Rosh Hashanah, accept him as king accepting upon yourself to do actions of Torah and mitzvot, which are going to be the channels for God's will in your life. We said there's going to be three other things we're going to discuss about mitzvot, and we're going to have to discuss them in the following weeks. The next one is how, how the mitzvot are God's limbs, whatever that means. We'll discuss more at length. We're going to discuss how uh, our limbs can actually connect with God. And uh, finally, we're going to discuss what's different of Torah from mitzvot, how Torah is different uh, from mitzvot. And uh, with that, we're going to stop the recording. And um, I appreciate everybody coming. <laughs>